point estimate is a single value estimate for a population parameter. The most unbiased, meaning it is not an over or an underestimate of the value, the most unbiased point estimate for population mean is the sample mean. And the less variability it has, the smaller the standard error or standard deviation of the sample mean is, the more accurate that estimation will be. So we're gonna start by taking a look at what a point estimate is. We have a researcher who is collecting data about a college athletic conference and its student athletes. This is a random sample of 40 student athletes and the number of hours they spent on required athletic activities for one week. We're gonna find a point estimate for the population mean of the number of hours spent on required athletic activities. So from the reading up above, we said that the best estimate for the population mean is the sample mean. The sample mean, remember, means taking all of these pieces of data, adding them up, so summing up all the x values, and dividing by the number of pieces of data or my sample size, which is definitely going to be 40. There are 40 numbers on the list. If you take the time to add up all of these, you should get 842, which gives us a population mean of 21.1 hours. And again, this is referred to as a point estimate because it's a single number estimate for what the population mean is, and it's based on the sample mean. Now, realistically, odds of the actual mean for the whole population being exactly this number are slim, but we hope it's going to be close. So usually, rather than talking about a point estimate, we find it more useful to talk about an interval estimate, which is just a range of values that gives you an estimate for a population parameter. This is where you'll hear the words margin of error. So if we know our margin of error is 0.6, what would be an appropriate interval estimate? So let's just think about this visually first. I'm saying that my sample mean that I calculated based on my 40 pieces of data is 21.1. That's my point estimate. Now the actual population mean is probably going to be some other number. It's rare it would be exactly this number. The margin of error establishes the boundaries for our estimate. So if the margin of error is 0.6, that's saying that this estimate, 21.1, could be off by as much as 0.6 units. So what we're gonna do is we're going to add 0.6 on to 21.1, and that gives us 21.7. So if 0.6 is the margin of error, the largest the population mean might actually be is 21.7. But that margin of error applies both ways. You'll usually hear margins of error expressed on TV and in the media as plus or minus a certain amount. Because not only can you be 0.6 units above your sample mean, the population mean might actually also be 0.6 units below. So if you subtract 0.6 from 21.1, you get 20.5. So my actual population mean has an interval estimate that it will be somewhere between 20.5 and 21.7. And this is usually a more realistic picture of what will occur than just the point estimate. But how do we determine this margin of error number based on our data sample? To do that, we're gonna talk about level of confidence. The level of confidence C is the probability that the interval estimate will contain the population parameter, assuming that the estimation process is repeated a large number of times. 
we generally use either a 90, 95, or 99% level of confidence. Each of these levels of confidence has an associated critical value. And the critical value is the value that separates your sample statistics that are probable, likely to happen, from your sample statistics that are improbable or unusual. Once we know what level of confidence we want to have in our estimate, the margin of error, capital E, is the greatest possible distance between the point estimate and the value of the parameter it's estimating. For a population mean where the standard deviation is known, here's your formula for margin of error. You can see it uses the critical value and the standard deviation of the sample means, which is the same as saying the critical value for that level of confidence times the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. And again, we've got conditions here. Your sample has to be random, and at least one of the following has to be true. Either your population is normally distributed, or your sample size is bigger than or equal to 30. So let's try calculating the margin of error for our point estimate. So here we made a point estimate. Now let's calculate the actual margin of error. So we're asked to take the data from example one and we want a 95% confidence level. Now we're given an additional piece of information which we need, which is the population standard deviation. Okay, that's reported to be 2.3. So first of all, we check our conditions. Number one, was our sample of 40 student athletes random? Okay, we always employ random sampling. So yes, it is random. The second thing we have to check is the sample size being bigger than or equal to 30 or that the population is normally distributed. In this case, our sample size is 40. So we've met the second condition also. So in order to find our margin of error, I'm going to take the critical value for the level of confidence I want and then multiply that by the standard deviation over the square root of the sample size. For a 95% confidence level, you'll just go back to this table and find the corresponding critical z-score. That value for 95% is 1.96. I fill in my standard deviation for the population, which was 2.3, over the square root of the sample size, which is 40. If you multiply these together, you'll get approximately a margin of error of 0 0.7. We are 95% confident that the margin of error for the population mean is 0. Point is, and I guess I should say about because that was a rounded value, is about 0. 0.7 hours. So we are 95% confident that we're going to find the mean within 0. 0.7 hours of the sample mean. So next you get a formula for calculating that confidence interval, but you already saw me do that once back up here. You take the margin of error and you add it to your sample mean and you subtract it from your sample mean, and that tells you where the population mean will be. So if we take this formula, I can use it to construct a 95% confidence interval for the mean number of hours spent on required athletic activities. To do that is quite simple now. I'm just going to take what my sample mean was, which was 21.1 hours, subtract what I calculated the margin of error to be, which is 20.4, and my population mean will be somewhere between that and the sample mean, 
with the margin of error added on, which is 21.8 hours. So I can say with a 95% confidence level that the population mean for the number of hours spent on required athletic activities is going to be between 20.4 hours and 21.8 hours. Here's another example. A college admissions director wishes to estimate the mean age of all students currently enrolled. So in a random sample of 20 students, the mean age is found to be 22.9 years. From past studies, they know the standard deviation is 1.5 years and the population is normally distributed. Construct a 90% confidence interval for the population mean age. In order to do this, we need to make sure we can use our margin of error formula that our sample is in fact random, which you can see it is. And we need to look at our sample size. Now our sample size is 20 and it's supposed to be at least equal to 30. Or remember there was a, a separate condition which was that the population has to be normally distributed. And we do know that second piece of information. So therefore our two conditions are still met even though the sample size was too small. So I'm allowed to use my margin of error formula, which is I take my critical Z score for my level of confidence that I want and multiply that by the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. My critical value in this particular case for a 90% confidence level is 1.645. So I'm gonna take 1.645 times what the standard deviation is known to be divided by the square root of the sample size. If you multiply these together, you will get an approximate margin of error of 0 0.6. So now to figure out your confidence interval, you're going to remember that you will subtract it from the sample mean and then add it to the sample mean because that was your point estimate. The sample mean was told to us to be 22.9 years. So I'm gonna take 22.9 minus 0 0.6 and then take 22.9 plus 0 0.6. That gives me boundaries of 22.3 and 23.5. So that's my 90% confidence interval for the population mean age. Or in other words, I can be 90% confident that the mean for all students, the population mean, will be a number between 22.3 and 23.5. Now, obviously, we want to be as close to 100% certain as we can, but that creates some issues because as you increase your level of confidence, as you say, I'm 90% sure or 95% sure or 99% sure, your confidence interval is going to widen. So in other words, these values are going to spread apart from each other. Because if I want to be 99% certain, I kind of have to cast a wider net to make sure I've caught my statistic I'm interested in. But as that confidence interval widens, the overall precision of the estimate decreases. So if I move these two numbers apart, so now they're, I'm, let's say, at 18 and 27, I have less certainty as to what my actual mean is going to be. So the precision decreases. One way that we can counteract this without having to back off and say, well, I guess instead of a 99% confidence level, I'll use a 90% confidence level, is to increase the sample size. Anytime you use a larger sample, you will get more accuracy. So this is something that if you're designing a survey, you can plan for in advance.
If you know what confidence level and margin of error you want, you can determine the minimum sample size you need to estimate the population mean. And that's done with this formula here. This formula is actually just a rewriting of this formula in which we solve for n. So if you remember some basic algebra and you can solve this equation for n, this is what you'll get. If n is not a whole number, we're going to round it up, always up to the next whole number. So in this last example, the researcher wants to estimate the mean number of hours spent on required athletic activities by all student athletes. How many student athletes do they need in the sample to be 95% confident that the sample mean is within half an hour of the population mean? So again, we're kind of setting goals or targets that we want to achieve. And then this tells us how big our sample has to be. So it's useful to know this when designing your study in the first place. We're going to use the formula listed above, and we just need to know what to substitute for each of these values. So I need my critical z-score for a confidence level of 95%, which is 1.96. I need my standard deviation, which we're going back to example two, where it said the standard deviation was 2.3 for the population. And I need to know what margin of error I'm looking for. And apparently I don't wanna be off by more than half an hour, 0.5. So I substitute this into my formula. I do 1.96 times 2.3 and then divide that by 0.5 and then square the result. When you do that, you'll get a sample size of approximately 81.29. Now, this is a sample size, and we can't take fractions of samples. So I either have to answer 81 or 82. And you never want to round down, even though this is a number that normally you would round lower because it's a 0.2. You don't want to do that because if you go too low, you won't have enough data to achieve the confidence level that you want. So please make sure that you know you will always round this minimum sample size up, meaning this researcher needs 82 students. If they survey 82 students, they can be 95% confident that whatever that sample mean is within half an hour of the population mean. So we're getting into some pretty advanced calculations, but it's kind of neat to see how people can take samples and then generalize and make predictions about the entire population.